Greetings and thank you for joining us on part five of the motion reading and review for the R. Kelly um, appeal case filed under 19 CR 286 with attorney Bon Jean. She's doing a wonderful job with our um, the way that we see the motion being read and we're going to keep moving into the motion. Now we're moving into um, racketeering, coercion, and enticement. We're going to go back there and start again. The government charged defendant with a Man Act violation under the separate theory that defendant transported Jane to California in September or October 2015 with the intent to violate California Penal Law Sections 261.5 and 261. 5. Unlawful sexual intercourse with a person under 18. Preliminarily, for the reasons argued, supra, the government simply failed to prove that defendant took any action to induce, persuade, entice, or coerce Jane into traveling to California. By late 2015, defendant and Jane were in serious relationship based primarily in Illinois where defendant resided. The age of consent in Illinois is 17, therefore, the defendant and Jane's sexual relationship was not prohibited there. Jane traveled with defendant to numerous states as one of his partners. She went consensually and voluntarily. Defendant did not have to induce, persuade, entice, or coerce her to travel, even if the government is correct that defendant had exerted some dominance or control in the relationship at the time. Furthermore, as argued in connection with Racketeering Act 5, the government provided insufficient evidence that defendant used any words to induce, persuade, entice, or coerce Jane to travel to California via a facility of interstate commerce. Under the plain reading of the statute, there must be a nexus between the use of the facility of interstate commerce and the words of persuasion, enticement, or coercion to satisfy a Section 2422 violation. The record is devoid of that proof. The mere fact that defendant texted with Jane about any number of things does not satisfy the interstate commerce element of this Man Act violation. D. Racketeering Act 9D, Transportation. It is true that in the state of California, the age of consent is 18. According to Jane, she had sexual relations with defendant in California during this trip when she was still 17 years of age. However, the government failed to prove defendant guilty of the Man Act under this theory where defendant's motivating purpose in traveling to California was not to have sex with Jane. Defendant and Jane had a consensual and legal sexual relationship in Illinois. Defendant's purpose in traveling to California was to perform and he arranged for his girlfriend to go with him. If defendant had sexual relations with Jane in California in September and October, it was purely incidental to the purpose of the trip. As Jane herself testified when asked, Q. And while you were 17, did you take additional trips to California with the defendant? A. Yes, I did. Q. And do you remember where you traveled to? A. I do not. Q. Do you remember what the purpose of your travel was for? A. He had shows. No rational juror could find that the government proved that defendant's motivating purpose in transporting Jane to California was to have sexual intercourse with her, particularly where he had an ongoing legal and consensual sexual relationship with her in the state of Illinois where he resided. At bottom, no nexus exists between the transportation of Jane and the alleged illegal sexual activity. 8. Racketeering Act 10. The government failed to prove Racketeering Act 10, that is, sexual exploitation of Jane where it offered insufficient evidence that defendant used, employed, persuaded, induced, or enticed Jane to take part in sexually explicit conduct for the purpose of producing a visual depiction between September 2015 and December 30th. The government contends that prior to Jane's 18th birthday, defendant recorded his sexual experiences with her in California. To demonstrate that defendant committed sexual exploitation of a child pursuant to 18 U.S.C. 2251, it is not enough for Jane to simply allege that defendant recorded sexually explicit conduct. Jane offered no testimony that proved that defendant used, persuaded, induced, enticed or coerced her into sexually explicit conduct during the relevant time period. Jane had an ongoing sexual relationship with defendant before the video recording incident and after the video recorded incident. Although Jane seems to regret those experiences, she did not offer sufficient evidence of enticement or coercion.
The government must prove that defendant did something more than just film the sexually explicit conduct. If the act of filming or recording alone was sufficient to sustain the charge, Congress would not have included a requirement that the defendant employ, persuade, indu, entire, or coerce. Furthermore, the government failed to prove that defendant acted with a purpose of producing a visual depiction of that conduct. Although the jury was erroneously charged that the government could sustain the charge by proving that the purpose was transmitting a visual depiction, the statute requires something different. Indeed, producing is defined by the statute as producing, directing, manufacturing, issuing, publishing, or advertising. 18 U.S.C. 2256 while the statute also prohibits the transmission of live visual depictions, defendant was not charged with transmitting a live visual depiction and there is no evidence that he did. Accordingly, the government failed to prove Racketeering Act 10 by proof beyond a reasonable doubt. 9. Racketeering Act 11, Forced Labor of Jane The government charged defendant with forced labor of Jane under a theory that defendant required Jane to participate in sex with other men and other women. Although at trial, Jane claimed that she did not want to participate in those activities and that she did not enjoy those activities, that does not mean that Jane was forced to participate in those activities. If Jane refuses even now to allege that she was forced by threats of violence to engage in certain sex acts, it is unclear why the government believes she was. Again, belatedly acknowledging that one really did not want to participate in the conduct is not the equivalent of being forced. The record is devoid of any evidence that Jane was forced within the meaning of the statute to have sex with individuals other than the defendant or that she was prohibited in any way from extricating herself from the relationship. The government's evidence that Jane was forced to participate in these sexual acts consisted of Alex's testimony that some women he had sex with were zombie-ish and that defendant had directed women other than Jane to participate in group sex. Rather than point the jury to specific evidence from Jane's testimony that reflected that she had been forced to participate in these activities through violence, restraint, or threat of violence, the government argued that defendant had directed Dominique to have sexual intercourse with Alex. While the government was permitted to offer an extraordinary amount of uncharged bad act evidence for various purposes, such evidence cannot supplant the government's burden to show that Jane, herself, was forced to participate in group sex acts. The evidence offered was insufficient proof of the offense of forced labor. As discussed in connection with Racketeering Act 6, the government cannot establish the offense of forced labor by simply showing that defendant and Jane had a sexual relationship that some might consider abusive. The government was required to establish a causal link between the group sex acts and threats of physical violence. It failed to do so. 10. Racketeering Act 12, the government charged defendant with two Man Act violations in connection with Faith's trip to New York in May 2017, alleging that defendant violated 18 U.S.C. Section 2421 and Section 2422. The government charged that defendant either transported or persuaded, induced, enticed or coerced Faith to travel to New York with the purpose of knowingly exposing her to an infectious venereal disease under New York Public Health Law Section 2307 and reckless endangerment pursuant to New York Penal Law Section 120. 20. The government failed to prove Man Act violations under Section 2421 and Section 2422 where it offered insufficient evidence that Defendant transported Faith with the intent of exposing her to herpes, or persuaded, induced, enticed, or coerced Faith to travel to New York with the intent of exposing her to herpes. Separately, the government failed to prove that defendant committed the offense of reckless endangerment or a violation New York Public Health Law Section 2307 which is unconstitutional in any event both facially and as applied to the defendant. A. Intent. Because there is no link connecting defendant's transportation of faith with an intent to expose her to herpes, defendant cannot be guilty of a Man Act violation. As discussed at length, Supra, the government must prove that the illegal sexual activity is the dominant, significant, or motivating purpose behind the transportation.
see United States vs. Kinslow, 860 F2D 963, United States vs. Lukashov, 694 F3D 1107, 1110, United States vs. Cryer, 232 F3D 1318, United States vs. Hayward, 359 F3D 631 3DCIR. 2004. Because the defendant's purported violation of a New York public health law prohibiting him from exposing a partner to herpes was incidental to Faith's trip rather than a motivating purpose in transporting Faith, the intent requirement of the statute cannot be sustained. The government argued to the jury that it should find defendant guilty of a Man Act violation by merely finding that defendant transported Faith to New York from her hometown in Texas for the purpose of sex. The only remaining issue is whether the sexual activity that he brought her here for was illegal, and it was. This argument is legally flawed. Transporting Faith to New York to have sex would not satisfy the elements of a violation under Section Section 2421 since the Sex Act itself was perfectly legal as Faith was a consenting adult. The activity that was allegedly illegal in New York was exposing Faith to herpes. It is that act that must be motivating purpose behind defendant's transportation of faith. Because the government cannot demonstrate a nexus between defendant's motivation for transporting faith to New York and the illegal sexual activity, defendant must be acquitted of the Section 2421 offense. b. Coercion or enticement. The government alternatively argues that defendant is guilty of the Mann Act stemming from Faith's trip May 18, 2017, trip to New York because defendant knowingly, persuaded, induced, enticed, or coerced Jane to travel to New York for the purpose of exposing her to herpes. Insufficient evidence exists to prove that defendant took any action to induce, persuade, entice, or coerce Jane into traveling to New York on May 18, 2017. The evidence shows that defendant invited a grown woman to meet him in New York, and she accepted. In March 2017, Faith attended one of defendant's concerts in San Antonio, Texas with her sister. Faith had an opportunity to meet defendant at an after-party backstage along with other individuals. Defendant and Faith had a conversation during the after-party and defendant provided her with his phone number. After that encounter, Faith and defendant kept in touch via text and FaceTime. The conversations were normal, appropriate, and pleasant. Defendant complimented her appearance. Faith testified that defendant referred to himself as, Daddy, during those conversations. According to Faith, defendant asked to be called by Daddy and she complied. Faith did not testify that defendant forced her to call him Daddy. Indeed, defendant and Faith had met exactly one time when Faith began calling him, Daddy. On the issue of travel, Faith had this to say. 5. The government makes much of the fact that defendant asked his girlfriends to call him, Daddy, so much so that the fact was pled in the indictment. There is nothing inherently criminal or even particularly unusual about the use of the moniker, Daddy, particularly in sexual relationships. Q. In your communications with the defendant, how, if at all, did the topic of traveling to see him come up? A. He had informed me that he was on tour right now, or excuse me, at the time, he was on tour, so he was just saying his schedule was kind of crazy, but whenever I wanted to come see him, I could, and he just said that he could arrange the days or just let him know when I wanted to come hang out. But that it would be fun, I would get to see, you know, how, how it is, how he is on tour, things like that. Defendant told Faith that if she wanted to come to his shows, she could contact his assistant and he would arrange it for her. Faith then contacted defendant's assistant who made travel arrangements for her. Originally, Faith was going to travel to Chicago but ultimately traveled to New York for one of defendant's performances. According to Faith, defendant informed her that he was having a show in New York and that he would like for me to come, hang out, it was going to be fun, so I said yes. Defendant's assistant arranged her travel and Faith traveled to New York to attend defendant's performance and hang out. No rational juror could conclude from Faith's testimony that defendant coerced or enticed her to travel to New York. By Faith's account, defendant was polite, generous, and appropriate, leaving it entirely at her discretion to come to New York to attend a concert. Defendant's alleged bad behavior with other women is not sufficient evidence of his specific conduct in connection with Faith on May 18, 2017. The government routinely asked the jury to find that it had proven elements of the charged offense simply because defendant had, from the government's perspective, been controlling and coercive to other women.
Faith's testimony does not establish any conduct on the part of defendant that shows that he did anything other than invite her to come to his concert in New York, an invitation she accepted. Frankly, if this conduct proves coercion or enticement, by proof beyond a reasonable doubt, the government is going to be very busy prosecuting Man Act violations. Although it seems unlikely that the government has much of an intention of using this provision to prosecute influential, wealthy white men who invite women on fancy trips for the purpose of engaging in sexual activity that those women later decide was unpleasant. C. New York Public Health Law Section 2307 and Penal Law 120.20 to sustain the Mann Act violations charged in connection with Faith's travel to visit defendant in New York on February 2, 2018, the government must prove that defendant intended to engage in a sexual activity for which he could be charged with a criminal offense. Pushing the boundaries of its prosecutorial discretion. The government alleged that defendant could have been charged with a violation of New York Public Health Law Section 2307 and or reckless endangerment because he created a substantial risk of serious physical injury when he had unprotected sex with Faith, knowing that he had herpes. At the outset, Faith did not contract genital herpes from defendant despite her misleading testimony. After returning from New York, Faith claimed she was diagnosed with herpes type 1 after getting cold sores on her mouth. Nearly 50% of the population has herpes type 1, and it can be contracted in any number of ways, including kissing, sharing a toothbrush, or eating utensils. Cold sores caused by herpes type 1 does not cause a substantial risk of serious physical injury. Presumably even the government would concede this point. Furthermore, as a matter of law, unprotected sex with someone who has genital herpes does not establish a substantial risk of serious physical injury. According to the City Health Department, one in four New Yorkers has genital herpes. If sexual intercourse with individuals who merely carry the genital herpes virus carries the substantial risk of serious physical injury, New York City would have an astronomical hospitalization and death rates from the transmission of herpes. Although the government's expert witness identified some serious, but unusual, health risks associated with the contraction of genital herpes, the offense of reckless endangerment requires a showing of a substantial risk of serious physical injury. Serious physical injury is defined as a person's physical conditions that creates a substantial risk of death or serious and protracted impairment of health. The government did not satisfy this burden. The risk of defendant transmitting genital herpes to Faith is unknown where he did not transmit it her, and there is no evidence that he was contagious or had an outbreak. If the government could show that defendant had active symptoms of herpes when he had intercourse with Faith, their proofs might be on a better footing. But merely having unprotected sex with someone who carries the virus cannot as a matter of law create a substantial risk of serious physical injury. Notably, the government cannot point to a single case that supports the prosecution expansive reading of this statute. Even if defendant had given faith genital herpes, the government's evidence would be insufficient to sustain a charge for reckless endangerment. Herpes is not deadly and rarely causes any serious, protracted health impairments. Again, the government's expert witness identified rare complications from herpes that could perhaps meet the definition under the reckless endangerment statute, but since those complications carry a low, rather than, substantial, risk of serious physical injury as defined by the statute. The government cannot, as a matter of law, sustain this claim. Separately, New York Public Health Law Section 2307 is unconstitutional, facially and as applied, for the reasons previously identified by defendant in his motion to strike allegations from count one of the superseding indictment and dismiss the remaining counts, DKT. Number 42. Additionally, the statute is void for vagueness as it fails to put the public on notice of what conduct constitutes criminal behavior and authorizes arbitrary and discriminatory enforcement. Sessions v. DeMaia, 138S Court 1204, 1212. One in six Americans suffer from genital herpes. Under the plain reading of this statute, even a person who carries the virus but has been asymptomatic for decades would commit a crime by having sexual intercourse with another. In the absence of a definition of infected, the statute is unconstitutionally vague.
While this court seems to assume that infected means having the virus rather than having the ability to transmit it, no authority supports this application, and such an interpretation would lead to arbitrary and discriminatory enforcement. Mm -hmm. 11. Racketeering Act 13. <coughs> No rational juror could conclude based on the evidence adduced at trial that defendant knowingly obtained, or agreed to obtain, any labor or services from Faith on January 13, 2018. A conviction of forced labor under 18 U.S.C. Section 1589 requires the government to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant obtained the labor or services of another person through, inter alia, threats of serious harm, and the defendant acted knowingly. United States v. Marcus, 487 F sub, 387, 310. The language, by means of, contained in the forced labor statute, 18 U.S.C. section 1589, requires the government to establish a causal link between the labor and services provided by the person and the threat of serious harm. ID. Section 1589 is intended to address serious trafficking or cases where traffickers threaten harm to third persons, restrain their victims without physical violence or injury, or threaten dire consequences by means other than overt violence. Machira v. Al Rawaf, 850 F3D 605, 618. The harm or threat of harm, considered from the vantage point of a reasonable person in the place of the victim, must be sufficiently serious to compel that person to remain in her condition of servitude when she otherwise would have left. ID. According to the government, on January 13, 2018, defendant violated the forced labor statute by using threats of violence to obtain labor, an act of oral sex, from faith. The forced labor statute was not intended to reach isolated conduct like that described by faith. Faith testified that she traveled to Los Angeles to see defendant, presumably to continue her romantic, sexual relationship with the defendant. She described an incident where she and defendant were in a small room in the Los Angeles studio where he worked. According to Faith, there was a gun in the room that made Faith intimidated, but defendant never touched the gun, threatened her with it, or made any gestures that he intended to use it. Faith was simply uncomfortable by its presence. After an intense conversation during which Faith described defendant as being serious but not threatening, defendant directed her to give him an oral sex and grabbed her neck before placing his penis inside her mouth. Without objection, Faith provided oral sex to defendant although she testified that she did not want to. The forced labor statute was not enacted to remedy isolated occurrences like the one described by Faith. Indeed, it is not even clear from Faith's testimony that she gave any indication to defendant that she did not want to give him oral sex, although she claims she did not to want to give him oral. The record fails to reflect a causal link between the isolated act of oral sex and any threat of physical violence, even if Faith felt intimidated by being in the same room where a gun was located. This event did not amount to forced labor. Furthermore, Faith traveled to visit the defendant against, even after this alleged act of forced labor where she now claims she did not want to participate in the act of oral sex. 12. Racketeering Act 14, the government charged defendant with a second set of Man Act violations in relation to Faith's second trip to New York on February 2, 2018. The government's evidence was insufficient for the same reasons argued in connection with Racketeering Act 11. First, the government simply fails to demonstrate that defendant transported Faith to New York on February 2, 2018, for the purpose of exposing her to herpes. Second, the record is devoid of any testimony that defendant coerced or enticed Faith to come to New York for the purpose of exposing her to herpes. Faith and defendant's so-called relationship was conducted almost entirely over text. After meeting at defendant's concert in San Antonio, Faith met the defendant face to fact no more than five times. Faith always returned to her home in Texas after her short excursions to visit with defendant. This was a grown woman who made decisions to travel with defendant, not out of fear, coercion, or any type of enticement, but because she wanted to. Faith herself refuses to identify as someone who was forced to do anything. On cross-examination, Faith admitted that she was not a victim and had made a choice to be with defendant. Q. In one of the podcasts we spoke about this morning, The Paper Route. On that show you said during that interview, I don't like the word victim because I don't feel like I'm a victim. I'm a young woman. And let's be clear, let's be clear, I made a choice to be involved with that person.
Do I feel like everything he did was right? Hell, no, but I had a choice. And that's why I walked away. I did not move in with him. I did not live with him. I did not take any money from him. There is a choice that you have to make. You said that, A. Correct. Q. You made a choice, A. Correct. Q. And you're not a victim, A. Correct. The record is devoid of evidence that proves that defendant coerced or enticed Faith to travel to New York in February 2018. The government must point to some specific words or conduct by the defendant that were coercive or enticing in respect to Faith. An invitation is simply not enough. Accordingly, the government failed to prove Racketeering Act 14. In sum, the government failed to prove the defendant guilty of RICO. 2. The government failed to prove counts 2 THROUH 9 of the indictment. The government charged defendant with four Freestanding Man Act charges that mirror Racketeering Acts 8 and 9, related to Jane. For the reasons argued, Supra, the government failed to prove counts 2 through 5 of the indictment. Similarly, the government charged defendant with four Freestanding Man Act violations that mirror Racketeering Acts 12 and 14. For the reasons argued, Supra, the government failed to prove counts 6 through 9 of the indictment. Conclusion For the foregoing reasons, this court should enter an order acquitting defendant of all offenses. Respectfully submitted. S. Jennifer Bonjean Jennifer Bonjean Bonjean Law Group, PLLC 750 Lexington Avenue, 9th FL New York, NY 10022-718-875-1850. Attorney for Robert Kelly. All right. And that concludes the motion that was filed by Attorney Bonjean on February 17, 2022, acknowledging that the federal court district um, overstepped many boundaries, did not take into consideration um, law that was outdated, refused to, you know, allow individuals who said that they were under that they were under age and lied about it they did not hold them in contempt because anything that is said in the court of law once a lie has been presented after that nothing is going to be validated nothing is going to be valued by the testimony and that has been law since america first created the criminal justice system so um, what are your thoughts on this? Um, I did break these down in increments where you can take a little bit of time because this is very heavy, very heavy. It took almost a month to, you know, really go over all of this data and, and for me to even look at how this case can literally be precedent to new law in technology. So that's where I feel all of this is headed. Even if he is adjudicated, even if he's given the um, new trial and everything is overturned, this still will hold some weight, some teeth in the way that the criminal justice system will move into the technological aspects of of crime. So... That's something we need to really, really be mindful of and start looking at research that can protect us online, privacy, confidentiality, and all that other stuff. You know, when we're dating online, when we're on these internet dating sites and different things like that, because someone can say that we literally did something and we never even met the individual. So I thank you for being part of this playlist podcast and uh we'll keep going i will report every sunday 6 p.m eastern standard time on updates about robert sylvester kelly or if there's any new issues found um right now this is going to be on hold until you know um until we hear something back from the court in If it's going to give a new trial, if it's going to, you know, correct their errors, possibly even to correct their errors is going to reduce the sentence to possibly time served because this is was a circus.
It was a circus full of damn clowns that impacted a man's entire career. And he said that on the Gayle King um, <clears throat> interview when he said social media has extreme power. But even this is not going to stop something great that is going to take place if it is to take place. So I thank you so much again for liking, sharing, commenting, subscribing to this channel. And we here at R. Kelly Appeal TV are grateful and we are our purpose here is to monitor the appeal status to make sure that no rights are being violated and document that if we do see it so that in turn we could help assist in the releasing of Mr. Robert Sylvester Kelly. So our Kells, stay up, baby. Stay up, stay up. We will see you on the other side, boo. All right. Thank you so much. And thank all the R. Kelly Nation supporters here at R. Kelly Appeal TV. Stay 100 and we'll see you next time.